thanks everyone for coming here today to learn about Georgia's state and local governments, which um, I think are very important. So um, just to go over, oh, sorry, there it is. Trying to click, okay. So uh, just a brief overview of what today will look like. Um, first, I'm just going to give a, a general overview of what the federal and state government responsibilities are. And then we'll jump into the key, the key things about Georgia's General Assembly. And then we'll talk about current county and local governments before talking about um, more current events related to government. So first, I'd like to start off with um, the type of structure of government um, that the U.S. has. We have um, what's called, we, the form of government is called federalism, where we have one national government and then state governments. So the power is actually a division of power. Um, the state is not, um, the state must abide to all federal laws over the state laws. And as we keep going down um, the, the layers of government, uh, there's county and local, which must follow the rules of um, the uh, higher governments. So just some terminology before we get started. Um, I'd just like to point out a few things about um, the parallelisms between the federal and state government. So in legislature, we call um, the legislature as the Congress. In Georgia, we call it the General Assembly. And our vice president is the president of the Senate and the federal, and we have what's called the lieutenant governor. Um, and we also had, have the gov the federal government is not um, you'd want to you want to pass the budget bill by October 1st or if we don't then we have what we sometimes see a government shutdown. Um, one key difference between Georgia is that the budget must pass by the end of the session. So we, we never go into uh, shutdowns. And just some more similarities, uh, requires a two thirds vote to override a veto by the president or the governor, um, have a house and Senate, and uh, we use committees to review um, bills. So just as a, an example, I'll just go over one example and try to move quickly through here. But um, diff the different levels of government have a different, um, a, a, Ha have control over issues um, to some extent. So at the federal level, if we're talking about educational issues, what the federal government looks at is they look for ways to improve academic achievement, um, make sure that everyone is receiving a high quality education, and they also give minimum funding to all states to uh, be able to achieve that um, high quality education. So at the state level, they distribute how the uh, how the how the schools are funded. Uh, we rely on a formula, which I won't go into, but you can look it up if you want on how we fund our schools. And in the local re local region, local governments uh, have more say on the funding on the funding of schools and um, can even um, add additional taxes and all sorts. So as you can see, um, every, every part of government is important in the process. So now I'd like to talk about the structure of our state government, which is uh, structured very similarly to how the federal government is. We have three different branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Um, and the governor is like the, the president and the vice president is analogous to the lieutenant governor. So just some key positions at the state level. Um, governor Brian Kemp is our current governor and he controls the, the budget and prepares those bill, appropriations bills for consideration. Uh, the lieutenant governor is also is um, is the president of the Senate, and he's she. They're responsible for um, determining the committees, who's going to be the leader, and 
uh, and kind of the structure of the Senate. And the Attorney General defends the um, Georgia's interests when it needs to go to court. The Secretary of State de deals with administrative um, things such as uh, voting and keeping track of um, corporations. And the Speaker of House is elected, the House leader and is elected by the House majority. And here are just some other um, uh, other key leaders, but for time's sake, I will just uh, keep going with the slides. So first I'd like to talk about the budget because uh, this is one of the most important jobs that the governor has is um, to create these budgets. And um, the, the governor has a lot of power on what gets funded and what Georgia's priorities are. So every year we need to pass, we actually pass two appropriations bills. So we, we pass um, one that's called the uh, amend, amended, amended budget, which looks at the current fiscal year and um, kind of look at where we need to be adjusting, um, the, adjusting the budget. And then the, the other one is the next fiscal year budget, which starts on July 1st. And um, that's uh, the budget that he proposes. So one thing that I do want to point out is that uh, Georgia must um, adhere to a balanced budget, which means it cannot spend more than um, how much it makes, how much revenue it gets that year. So there are four um, entities that are important in the development of the state budget. Um, as I've mentioned, you have the governor um, and the general assembly, the office of planning and budget and the state agencies. So let me just uh, kind of explain what's going on here and the process of how we develop the, the state budget. So the governor will first um, give their, their guidelines uh, in the summer and tell, tell everyone what they want. So they, they tell the states, oh, uh, this is what I want in, in this budget and create guidelines. And the state will then look, review those guidelines and create a budget for themselves for the fiscal year. And uh, the, after they've created the plan, they submit it to the Office of Planning and Budget and the, the OPB acts like uh, a middle person between the governor and the state agencies where um, the state, the OPB is uh, uh, reviewing, auditing the state agency's needs. And they're also uh, advising the government, the governor on um, possible policy recommendations. And after you have this uh, three-way conversation between them, the governor will then um, make their budget proposal to the General Assembly before it goes um, into the legislature. So uh, just some things, the, um, this is the general timeline of um, when the main parts of this process happen. So in the summer, the governor proposes, um, yeah. So by January, the governor should propose uh, an appropriations bill to the General Assembly. And um, once the appropriations bills pass, then they, <clears throat> sorry, they, they either sign it or they don't, in which it has to become law after 40 days of not signing, or they can also do some line item vetoes. Okay, so uh, just a few days ago, uh, the, the governor just released his budget, um, his proposed budget. And it's actually one of the most more expensive um, budgets that's been released in recent times. Uh, he proposes that he wants to spend $30.2 billion in state spending. And to put that in perspective, that's 11% more than last year's budget um, that we signed, or sorry, this year's budget. And some of the things that includes are uh, salary increases for state employees and teachers, um, income tax 
uh, refunds and also um, some of these sectors. Uh, as you can see, most of the budget is a, a portion to K through 12 education and then healthcare and then college, transportation and so on. So when the appropriation bill um, is in, in Congress or in the General Assembly, um, it goes through a very similar process as um, the federal, as what happens with the bill at the federal level. So first it all starts with the citizens. The, the citizens talk to their legislators um, and then the legislators will draft the bill and introduce it. And once they've um, drafted that bill, they, um, it's assigned a number and it goes into a committee for review. And then once it's in committee, that's kind of where it's um, kind of hashed out, like the details are hashed out. Um, people are giving public testimonies at this time. And this uh, stage is crucial because this is where they recommend whether to pass, to not pass or make amendments or hold the bill. And then it will go through another reading, a second reading. Um, there's actually three readings it must go to before it goes through a vote. So that's why there's that second reading. And uh, after the second reading, it's put on a calendar for the third reading. And to get on the calendar, the rules committee will look at the bills that um, have, have passed through the committees and prioritize by which ones they want to see um, in the sessions. And um, at, this, at this time, they, the members will then vote on uh, the bills and all you need is a simple majority to um, pass um, to, to pass the either house or Senate. So um, yeah, so um, let me talk about crossover day, which is what I said just now is that the bill needs to pass um, the House or Senate. So crossover day is a deadline for um, when bills can cross over so that it can, can continue on and be considered for the rest of the session. And the at last, the governor can sign or veto and veto uh, needs a two thirds majority. So, I tried to mention crossover day or earlier there, but crossover day is the time, as I mentioned, it's really important. You want to make sure that your bill does definitely cross over. If not, it will, um, it can still be considered the next session, but um, you might have to, it, it might get stalled. So crossover day is a really important day for um, local ab advocates. Uh, the other important day is signy day. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, but this is the last day of um, the legislative session. So the session, um, the General Assembly can only meet for 40 days. So it's it's the 40th day that they're in session. And uh, July 1st is when most bills go into effect. Okay. Um, let me just. So, just some more tips about the 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 about engaging with uh, your legislators. It's you, you have to be in, um um you have to have a relationship with your lawmakers uh, very early, and you want to start these conversations early and not just show up uh, during the spring when you want um, to have some bills passed. Uh, also, you want to stay engaged throughout the whole year. In the summer and fall uh, is a good time to reach out to state agencies. Um, you can start like just asking them about their budget. Maybe you can um, tell them what's important to you, what you want in the budget. And then in the winter and spring, you want to start really reaching out to your legislators and um, advocating for those bills. And the main important uh, part of the process, I think, is the when the bills are in committee. 
So when they're in committee, that's when they're more likely to be influenced by you and undergo changes. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on while it's on committee, putting pressure on your lawmakers and uh, take advantage of the public commentary period while it's, it's at this stage. Because once it gets out of committee, uh, not many amendments are usually added. So the committee is really the place where you have a lot of say. Okay, so now we can talk about uh, local governments. And uh, I think they're, they're important and everyone just thinks about the federal government, but uh, local governments uh, such as county and city are also very important because you can make more change that is relevant to your own experience and you have a shared experience with locals. So there are three types of local, local governments that we have. We have the county government, the city government or municipalities, and what's called a special purpose government. So special purpose governments are created by the city or the county government and has one specific focus. So um, for example, district school boards are considered special purpose governments. Um, Management of wildlife and, uh, is also another type of special purpose government. And um, here's just how many different governments we have in Georgia. And the residents will elect, these are just some of the um, key leaders in uh, local governments. And the purpose of local governments is to provide resources and services such as maintaining buildings and roads, running elections and such. So now I will talk about the different types of county governments that we have. And um, before we get into that, I'd like to think about, I, I thought about why are there so many different types of structure or why are there so many different types of governments? And I think that the reason why is because um, government is trying to um, make laws and pass laws and enact laws, right? And they want to do that in a very efficient way and in a results oriented manner as well. So the way they um, are trying to um, reach those goals is by uh, changing or influencing the power distribution within the different types of government. So um, as you'll see, there's a lot of similarities between each ones, but there are subtle differences that kind of uh, sways the power distribution from one way or another. So uh, I will just give a very brief overview. This can be a lot more complex, um, but I don't have time to go into that. So uh, the traditional commission type of government has a, so you, we have the voters and they elect for, for today's purposes, I will just focus on the board of commissioners. Uh, they act like the, the legislature or small legislature. And uh, in the board of commissioners in this type of government, they have, uh, they have executive power over um, different agencies or different departments. Um, the traditional commission, the model is not very efficient because as you can see, they have, they have legislative power and must um, uh, make a lot of um, compromises. And they also have executive power over um, the different departments. Okay, so the next type is what's called the sole commissioner, which um, structurally looks a lot like the um, traditional commission, except instead of having a board of council members, you only have one sole commissioner. And that one person kind of like repre represents the board. And so they have legislative and executive power. 
as you can see, they control all of these departments. So this is actually very different from traditional because um, power is very concentrated and makes the sole commissioner very popular. I mean, start powerful. And um, this is also uh, rarely found outside of Georgia as well, but we do still have uh, county governments that follow the structure. Okay, so in the elected executive, I think this might be the most uh, familiar to us. We have the, um, the three branches where <clears throat> the board of commissioners again, acts as a as the legislature and they appoint some people and then they have a chief they've introduced a chief executive officer which acts kind of like the president and has varying levels of um, power and the the executive officer can usually appoint their own um, leaders Okay, so in a county admin, a, admin administrator gov, type of government, um, the, the Board of Commissioners still act like the legislature, but they appoint a what's called a county administrator to help them um, with, the, with the process. So um, they do, deal with more administrative work and also act as an advisor to the Board of Commissions. But the Board of Commissions in this case is still powerful because it um, still has a lot of say on the key leadership of the departments, whereas the county administrator is a subordinate role to the board and um, works for the, the board's um, interests. So the administrator style is different from what's called the commission manager type of government where the board, um, unlike the last model, they, they hire a county manager and the county manager actually just has a lot more power compared to the administrator. Uh, the county manager, as you can see, appoints um, the different types of key leaders. And uh, they also have a lot of power over um, the departments and also the budget. Okay, so this is just a food for thought slide um, and this is an interesting um, map of all the different um, the, the five different types of government structures around Georgia so I think it's just kind of fun to look at what where you live and what type of um, government structure uh, your county follows so now moving on from county governments um, in municipal government, um, th they also try to, the main purpose is to try to find that great balance of power um, dispersion. So it, it's very similar to actually the, the, the council government, but just smaller. So um, we have what's called the, the strong mayor form and the weak mayor form. So in the strong mayor form, uh, the, the mayor has a lot of say on the budget and also has veto power. Whereas in the weak mayor form, they, all the, the powers are, are shared. And so there's not a lot of executive authority. So basically it's like the mayor is still working with the council. And in the council manager form, um, this one is kind of weird. Uh, so the mayor is um, el elected by the people and um, it, it's mainly the leader of the city council, which is um, different from the manager, which the manager kind of has more of the executive duties. So um, the, the, the mayor basically is just the leader of the city council at, in this form. Um, 
Okay, so now I will go over um, redistricting and gerrymandering and explain what this means. So redistricting happens in the US because when we hold elections, we, um, we base the winners based on the number of elect electoral votes that we get, right? So uh, this map is just showing the number of electoral votes each um, each state has relative to each other. And the more people you have, the more electoral votes you get. So California has a lot of people, so it has a large amount. And um, let me see what else I wanna say about. Yeah, so then at the federal requirements, oops, sorry. Um, there are just some requirements uh, that the the way you divide up these um, votes that, that um, they're roughly equal in population and can't discriminate based on race. And um, I'll talk about redistricting in Georgia later, but um, our requirements is that redistricting must, the meetings must be open to the public and that the maps must be um, publicized once it's um, once it's really once it's in the committees and also it must comply with the Voting Rights Act, which I will also go over in a little bit. OK, so gerrymandering is um, is all is similar to redistricting or a form of redistricting, but in gerrymandering, what you're doing is you're trying to manipulate the results uh, based on how you partition it. Whereas in redistricting, you're, you're just partitioning and um, trying to make sure that everything's proportionate. So um, let me describe a little bit how this works. So let's pretend we have a, a population and um, you have uh, 40% of people who their favorite color is yellow and 60% where their favorite color is blue. So um, in this case, if you're painting a building and you're trying to decide what color the building should be um, based on this, um, pro this um, survey, you would paint it blue because that's, um, that's the majority of the votes. So whatever, uh, however, you just you uh, decide to split up the districts, they should be proportionate to the outcome of it as a whole, if that makes sense. So, because they need to separate this into different districts, there's a countless number of ways to to do this to separate it. Um, some of them is what's called the proportionate outcomes, which means that it represents um, the, the, the say of the whole or of the population. So in this case, this is proportionate because if you look at one strand, one group, um, and you ask yourself who wins, so yellow's winning here, yellow's winning here, and blue wins three times. But if, oops, sorry. Uh, if you look at it uh, in this way, separated differently, you'll see that blue wins here, yellow wins in this one, blue wins. But this is still uh, appropriate because you still have three regions that are blue and two that are yellow, which matches the, it represents what the population as a whole has. And disproportionate outcomes is when that's what's called gerrymandering and when it does not represent what um, the whole looks like. So as you can see here, if you divide it this way, blue wins all the time. And so um, yellow does not have much um, power if it's divided this way. But if you divide it this way, you see that yellow wins a lot. And so you can see that you can manipulate the outcome basically. So redistricting, the way you redistrict is really important um, because they can determine um, the outcomes of um, the election process, which is why at the, at the uh, federal level, 
um, or different states, sorry, different states have different strategies for um, redistricting, redistricting in the states. So some have an independent redistricting um, team and some have bipartisan control um, and, and Georgia um, has the legislative control. So the legislature has total control um, of the maps, which um, currently is Republican controlled. And uh, yeah, and also one thing about this map, this map is uh, different from the last map. This map is the number of House of Reps each um, state gets. So for Georgia, Georgia has 14. So we have 14 House of Reps in federal, at the federal government. So the, this is just some guidelines for the states on um, how they're going to divide their districts um, and just some general rules um, that they must follow. Um, so mainly you don't want it to look really crazy. You want it to be pretty um, square as, as best as you can um, and um, trying not to dilute the votes. Okay, so after talking about uh, the different types of governments uh, that we have at all levels, um, one thing that I think are the most important are the voters themselves, because as you can see from all the hierarchies, the, the voters really influence um, the type of government or what government can deliver. And so now I'll just talk about um, just the, the recent uh, voting, um, vo voting curtain events um, in the nation and at the Georgia level. So let me start with bringing up the Voting Rights, of, voting rights Act, VRA, of 1965. And this is a, a very significant bill that um, helped protect the 15th Amendment of minority groups of voting. And um, once it was enacted, what it did was it banned literacy tests, um, gave federal oversight on voter registration um, in, in some states. And um, the, the consequence or the effect of this uh, law is that voter turnout increased in the South where um, the votes were often um, underrepresented by minorities. So there are 16 states that had to um, have federal oversight and Georgia is one of them, was one of them. So now let me go over uh, this case oops, called Shelby County v. Holder, which, um, which is challenges a section, a part of the Voting Rights Act. So the part of the Voting Rights Act that requires federal oversight is uh, in section five. And the, the states that or counties that need the federal oversight is based on the history of race-based voter discrimination. So it just looks at um, whether in the past they've done it before. And so Shelby County argued in 2013 that section five wasn't fair that it was um, being uh, given federal oversight. And the outcome of the ruling of this case is that uh, they looked at section four, which evaluated who gets, um, who gets federal oversight. And they said that th this is, um, is outdated just, just to base it off of um, history. So because section four says you're, okay, you know what, like we don't like how we base who gets oversight and not, um, section five doesn't, is not really relevant. And so essentially what we have now is that um, the government does not, um, section five no longer uh, is relevant. And so federal oversight is no longer um, a requirement. And um, so I want to talk about how um, what's happened rec more recently. Uh, there's a lot of voting laws that have been 
uh, that have been passing. And a lot of them, some people have, um, have claimed that they're diluting the votes or manipulating it too much. Um, one that passed in Georgia was SB 202. And um, not gonna go over all of the new changes, but here are the, the main changes. Um, it limits the number of absentee ballot drop off, um, drop boxes, um, requires an ID. So it, it just added more restrictions to, um, to um, being able to vote in Georgia. Um, and uh, the main arguments for and against are presented here. So um, on one side, one side says that it makes it harder to vote and it affects minority voters disproportionately and that there's no evidence of election fraud and never has been. So it was unnecessary to have this law and uh, it targets mainly large democratic counties in Georgia. And on the other side, we have people um, being concerned about voter fraud and um, not having confidence in, in the government. And um, they claim it makes it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. Okay, so uh, for the future elections in Georgia, um, just keep in mind of the new changes um, that have gone um, into effect. Mark your calendars on the key dates when um, you should have voted by, like marking when the runoffs are. Um, as soon as you're able to request the absentee ballot, request it. Um, you can preview what's gonna be on the ballot before before you vote. So uh, you can do more research before, before filling it out. And um, different states have different, um, they have different ways of treating voting as far as time off. So in Georgia, you are, um, you have to have your, you have a right to two hours of unpaid um, leave for voting. Um, in other states, they have paid leave. Um, and also I encourage you to, um, make everyone you know vote and uh, help them understand why it's it's really important. Okay, and so as you can see from the different types of government structures I presented, that uh, the most important part in the process is us. So voting um, needs to continue because I think it's a, a superpower that we all have. Um, and unfor unfortunately, like, um, it can be, um, as we saw, results can be um, manipulated in some ways and may sound discouraging, but um, we have to keep voting and keep fighting for um, the issues that you care about. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Science for Georgia, for giving me this opportunity. All right, thank you, Johanna. So I did not mention this before, but today we also have um, our own, uh oh, I was gonna say that Amy uh, of, of Science for Georgia, who does our uh, advocacy is going to present, but she is currently at a uh, swim meet and will be busy for about the next two minutes. So instead, I'm gonna go ahead and open up um, the floor to questions. So I'll, I'll start off with, Johanna, do you have a preferred form or structure of local government? Uh, yes, I do. I like the, the man where there's a manager involved in both the, the city and county level because the manager, it, the purpose is to, make sure like everything's organized and is not supposed to be involved in the politics very much. So I kind of feel like when, if the manager makes more decisions, it's more, less likely to be influenced by, um, by um, politics. Yeah. And do you have 
an example of uh, a local government that follows that structure? I know that you're not in Georgia right now, so even if it's somewhere else, do you know of one? Uh, yeah, I think if I remember correctly, I was just looking, I, I used to live in Savannah, Chatham County, and we follow a, um, the, the type of government I just said, the, the one with a professional manager. Um, yeah, but I just think that's really interesting. Um, and it's, there's a lot more complexity um, to the governments. <laughs> so um, I encourage everyone to read more about that. There's just, uh, I was amazed by how varied and how many, how, how convoluted it can be. And you mentioned uh, ways to get in touch with your representative um, or that you should get in touch with your representative early when they're you're not busy in session and everybody's trying to yell at them at the same time. Uh, would you recommend forms of contacts like phone, uh, town halls, and like physical letters over say online forms? So yeah, I agree that attending town hall meetings and introducing yourself um, and interestingly, like I never thought about writing physical letters, but after attending some of um, Science for Georgia's advocacy engagement events, um, some of the pe leadership that you've had have said that they really appreciate having handwritten letters sent to them. So uh, it works for them. They really like it. So hopefully you do it as well. Um, I think like just filling out a form online it, it just feels like it, it's generic, not very specific, and that you're not really trying to get to know your legislator. So uh, having that more personal connection is important. And even if you don't need to talk to them like at the moment, like you can at least like give them a personal email or letter saying, oh, this is who I am, this is what I care about. Um, and they'll appreciate that. You don't have to ask for anything because when the time comes, they'll remember you. Yeah. Uh, we got a question. Do you know if there have been any concerns about the new Georgia redistricting maps? Yes. I think there has been a lot of concerns about the, the, re, the redistricting maps. Um, let me see if I actually, I did not include it in my presentation, but um, I kind of showed how they've uh, broken down the sixth and seventh um, district, if I recall. Um, and it, it kind of shows you um, how blue or how red it used to be and before and after. Um, it's very interesting. And I think it's, it's very controversial um, how these maps have been drawn. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so from what I've heard, the main complaints are about making it safer for the uh, elected officials. So the blue um, regions are bluer, the red regions are redder, and so there's less competition. Oh, I think we have Amy on. Okay, Amy, I've got your presentation. Um, let me, Hi, guys. Let me pull that up. Can you all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Amy. Oh. Yay! <laughs> All right, so before All right. we go back to uh, further Q&A, uh, Amy, our executive director and head of advocacy, has a short presentation to give. So, Amy, uh, what, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Thank you so much, Lewis. Uh, let's all, I'm so excited to have Yohana talk today. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to her for this, uh, for that talk. Um, Yohana was a great intern. Um, we were like super proud, but also super sad when she got that job in California because we lost her as someone who was doing a great job for Science for Georgia. But um, she totally deserved the job in California, and we're so excited for her um, to be doing wonderful, great things there. Um, so, uh, as Liz said, I'm Amy, um, and because we're a small organization, I wear many hats, and my two big ones are executive director and director of advocacy. Uh, Lewis, next slide, please. 
Um, so, uh, so Johanna was talking about all, like, how our government works, um, and how the legislative assembly breaks down and how you, you can get involved here in Georgia. And so, um, you know, we like to take that a step further here at Science of Georgia and give you all ways to advocate for how science can have an impact on public policy in our everyday lives. So in 2021, um, we focused on education, water, and food. Um, for education, we hosted a speaker series and a roundtable about education and workforce. Um, for water, we work a lot with the Georgia Water Coalition and trust fund allocation and um, things like that. And then for food, um, we hosted a roundtable about food insecurity. And because of that, um, all three of these actions and involvements, we built some meaningful relationships with legislators around the state um, and organizations around the state that also work in these areas. Um, and we were invited to speak in front of the Senate Special Committee on the Food Desert. Uh, next slide, please, Lewis. Um, so this year we're, we're carrying on that work, right? Um, as Johanna said, the uh, General Assembly just gaveled in on Monday on the 10th. Um, and to really just point out how much we love sports here in the South, it gaveled in that tent on Monday traveled out 10 minutes later so everyone could go to the Georgia um, championship game and uh, the legis the general assembly will be done after 40 days and it will always be done before the masters kick off in April um, but so this year we really want to carry forward the work that we're doing and we're kind of like right in the thick of it um, so we're really carrying forward evidence-based um, practices that emerged out of all these roundtables that we held last summer, all the people that we talked to, and all the great work that our interns did. Um, so next slide, please, Lewis. Um, so this year for education, we're going to focus on um, creating a study committee about evidence-based literacy education um, and proper ratios for school counselors and school nurses. Um, so this is exciting that the governor is willing to spend more money this year. So that's great. Um, so that'll really increase funding for things. And um, another thing to note is that it's an election year. And so there's um, very few like hardcore pieces of legislation we'll get through this year because all the crazies are going to come out to try and, you know, say that they did something for very niche interest in their districts. So focusing on things like creations of a study committee or um, kind of things that will move the needle forward, but don't um, create a very large systematic change are probably all that's going to get accomplished this year. Um, for water, we're um, still working a lot with a lot of environmental organizations around the state. And so our two big focuses are um, saving the Okies and Okie Swamp from a proposed mine and, um, as, and again, sticking with proper coal ash disposal. Um, coal ash just had a great victory in that the EPA sent a very angry letter to the Georgia Environmental Protection Division about how they're not properly permitting storage in this system. And then for food, um, we're working very hard to, to around things about measuring the true cost of food and community tax, uh, task forces. All right, so um, next slide, please, Lewis. Um, if you look at all this, um, at the core of these things, they're all very connected. Uh, so you can't learn if you're hungry or if your water is contaminated, and you can't grow enough of affordable food unless you've got clean water and healthy soils. And um, fun facts like um, our farm workers qualify for food stamps and people who live in neighborhoods with Unclean water, unless green space and reduced access to healthy food, also are more likely to have chronic diseases, right? So all of this is very much connected. Um, next slide, please, Lewis. Um, um, so a specific example of kind of how all these cycles 
are um, linked together. Um, so if you look at like the food cycle, um, right, uh, uh, weather extremes um, can increase like pathogen load in soils. And so then you have to use more fertilizer on your farmland. And then it, when you do that, you release more carbon dioxide and then um, and then water temperatures go up and you, or and air temperatures go up and so then you've got more food spoilage and then when you've got extreme climate events, then food costs more, right? And so, and then this keeps going on and on and on. But um, if you think about the cycle in another way, if you could improve farming practices, you've got decreased emissions and runoff and I think you click forward, Lewis, hopefully, because now we're in like the happy blue slide. Um, we've got uh, resilience leading to extreme weather, um, increased nutritional content, um, improved profitability, and less extreme weather, right? So, so there's vicious cycles and there's virtual cycles for all of these things. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, so, now hopefully you're all seeing a slide with a man with a lever. Um, so at the heart of our mission, we look for science levers that can have big impacts and address root causes. Um, so we really want to get these vicious cycles and kick them in the pants to make them become virtuous cycles. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of studies about how programs that lift up the economic standing of uh, people in any way really improve and have positive effects around the entire community. And, um, you know, and that which can be measured can be improved. Um, and really, we want to keep things simple and really look at the root of things. Um, so all that, so if we're on the next slide, please. So all of that is a great way of saying that we are now going to be focusing a lot on environmental health um, because this kind of chips away at the root causes of a lot of those things that we were talking about before. Um, so to that end, there are two specific bills, HB339 and HB432, um, that are before the legislator, um, and they focus both on equitable physical environments. Um, so that for 339, um, it's the Environmental Justice Act. So this would create a commission to conduct scientific analysis and in including safe case studies on um, facilities and areas that are um, having that require environmental permits. And 432 would establish um, uh, higher permit application requirements um, for like facilities that are then located in overburdened communities. Um, and as you can tell, I'm out of swim feet and they're screaming. All right. So, uh, finally, last slide, please, Lewis. Thank you. Um, so I hope you got inspired by, uh, Johanna's talk and my talk to like save the world, right? We can do this. Um, and so, you know, we would really like you to then take this opportunity to get involved, right? And so, like, we were talking about, like, how can you get involved? And a great way to get involved is to send your legislator an email or not, an email or a letter or pick up the phone. Um, and so, throughout the year, you know, we provide stuff to do in our newsletter. Um, but we are launching what we are calling an action network. Um, and so... If you want to be more informed about what's going on, especially across things that you can advocate for in the policy arena, um, we will be using that action network to send you specific things to act on, especially right now during the session. So things we might ask you to do is write your legislator about a specific bill or a topic that's in front of their committee or um, like Johanna said, sometimes things get stuck into a committee or stuck in one part of the process and so a couple extra emails or phone calls will really push a thing out of a committee or onto the calendar or things like that. Um, and to um, and if there is a public comment period on a bill, um, anyone can sign up. You do not have to be invited. You can literally show up at the Capitol. And now because of COVID, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of these COVID period, public comment periods, half of them are online. So you can like zoom into them. 
and you just have to know when they are and sign up and then you can make your voice heard. So we want to use this action network to kind of give you guys alerts about things that are going on so you could take the next step. Um, so that is that for my presentation. I'd like to say thank you again to everyone. All right. Thanks, Amy. I guess that's it. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, again, please please click through the link. Uh, thank you so much, Johanna. Uh, thanks, Amy, for calling in. Thank you. And everybody have a have a great weekend.